In the next interview, I will be talking with a team that works on SWIFT. And like some of the other projects we've talked about, SWIFT is one of the projects that just has to just work. It, it's not something that uh, can suffer failure if you want your cloud to be reliable. So these are people that, that we trust a great deal with our, with our networks. Um, if you would introduce yourselves and say where you work and, and what your role is on the project. My name is John Dickinson. I'm the project technical lead for OpenStack Swift, and I work at Swift Stack in, based in San Francisco, California. I've been involved with Swift and OpenStack forever if, since the project started. Uh, That's you. My name is Kurt Cizak. Uh, I'm working uh, at the uh, Corebio for Swift, and I'm based, uh, working for NTT based on Japan. Japan and uh, it, uh, telecommunication company, and basically I'm working for the uh, Asia Korean on the streets. Yep. And uh, my name's uh, Matt. I'm another core reviewer for Swift. I work at Suze, um, and I've been, I guess, involved for the last three, four years. I don't, I can't remember now. Tell us a bit about what happened in Pike. What's, what's new and interesting um, in your, your erasure credit coding work? Sounds interesting to me. But uh, tell us what else is in the, in the Pike cycle and, and what that leads into in the coming cycle. The biggest thing is the global erasure code, so you should talk about that's that, Goda. <laughs> the global, global erasure code is the uh, cost of the three key components. One, the issue duplication. The two, the second is the uh, accomplished bring. And the third is the uh, uh, affinity path policy, and uh, that's all it for the uh, helps to build the major code in cluster all over the world. So global cluster it means uh, we can build uh, one switch cluster uh, across the distributed uh, data centers. So uh, now we can control the major code uh, uh, from the global cluster to retrieve when uh, to retrieve the stored object when uh, this center is in the investor like this and offline. So that then could start. So I've got a Swift cluster uh -huh. and it's great. Yeah. The Swift is great, right? Yeah. Okay. It had I put it in one data center, but the problem is hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, etc. Data center goes down, I've lost my head, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's terrible, it's not do that. So let's put it in two data centers. So we can put we can replicate a copy from one data center to the other, right? Yep. Okay. Why can't we just do that with the ratio codes? Why? What was the hard part with that? Yeah, the ratio code is the best uh, less uh, less duplication uh, rather than replication. Uh, so and uh, so basically that's uh, the ratio code uh, split the original objects and. Uh, have the small packages, and uh, that spread the uh, all uh, data spread into the uh, Swift cluster. Yeah. And uh, basically, we need to retrieve uh, uh, some uh, data set to uh, reconstruct to the object. Mm -hmm. However, uh, we cannot uh, control the placements. Uh, in the switch question. Uh, so okay, so, multi so, you, so if there's two regions, if there's two data centers for the Swift cluster, you couldn't control where the erasure code fragments go, yeah. which means that if one region went down, you didn't have enough to reconstruct the object. Exactly. So with the, the pieces that, uh, that you were writing for the EC replication means that we can take these fragments, yeah. we can duplicate them, yes. and then we can spread that out in the cluster. Yeah. And that's the other part of it, which is the uh, composite rings, yeah. which allows you to say, yeah, I so want specifically half of them over here yeah. and half of them over here. Yeah. And yeah, what this means better is... Better choice in placement of those... Um, right, so this means that you now have two, two data centers. One is in Tokyo and one is in New York. Uh -huh. And there's still one global namespace. Yes. But if one of them goes out uh -huh. because of a hurricane or earthquake or something like this, 
then you can still fully access and use the data and it's completely online in the other one. Exactly. That's awesome. That's what, fantastic. What's really cool about this to me is that I interviewed somebody in Atlanta at the four, previous PTG, and they said, this is what we're going to be working on and it's going to be really hard. It's a, it's a, big, it's a, a big challenge. And so it's really cool to come back six months later and see that, that that's a done deal. Yeah, it's, it's a great feature. So that being said, um, there were some other things that were, uh, you know, obviously some smaller features, and there's been a lot of time on some, some bug fixes and performance improvements, but the global erasure codes is just an absolutely amazing feature that enables yeah. a huge amount of additional functionality that wasn't previously possible. And in fact, compared to other storage right. systems that are out there, open source and proprietary, it's extremely hard to even find any storage systems that effectively do this in an optimal way, which is something that Swift now supports. I guess something else that came in pipe that's uh, still in its infancy would be uh, kind of a little bit experimental, I guess, too, uh, is the part power increase. Yeah. So when you have an object and uh, you'd have to decide on how many parts to store on all the data. Like, wait, so when you have a... Well, let's back up a little bit. So yeah. it's the <laughs> part of the data placement algorithm yeah. we have to overall figure out, um, given all of the hard drives that we could put the data on, What's the effective way to balance all of the data we have across all of those yeah. hard drives? So how do you partition that? Yeah, that makes so, up. Uh, uh, previously, there was this. There's a singular number you had to choose that uh, really would determine a, the maximum possible number of hard drives you could have in a cluster. And generally, that's measured in hundreds of thousands, uh, sort of thing. Even for large me it, it, even for you know medium-sized clusters. Um, and uh, the problem is if you chose a too big of a number, then you would have a lot of overhead in uh, like file system overhead on the hard drives, and so it was less effective use of your storage space. If you choose a number that was way, way too small, then you would have uneven balancing. So the new feature that uh, we were able to implement that I think is gonna be good going forward to allow people to grow from very small clusters to very, very large clusters um, allows you to update that number over the lifetime of the cluster which means that, uh, again, you can, you can deploy, say, a few terabytes of a uh, you know, small number of drives and then grow into a multi-petabyte yeah. cluster and maintain a high level of efficiency of the data placement. You don't have to kind of try and look into the future and pick how big will I potentially grow. You can actually grow with the cluster. Ooh, yeah. Bigger than Google. Bigger than Google. <laughs> I mean, we also have, obviously, storage policies, which is a way you can kind of do this, but then you have to deploy a new storage, a bigger sure. storage policy, but then what about the old data in some side? You know, yeah. this just allows you to continue to grow, which is, I think, a really force. Yeah. It makes it a lot easier to set up, in my point of view. It does. A great point. It uh, can be used in the online mode. Mm -hmm. We don't have to offer any storage. Yeah, right? that's important. Exactly. Yeah. Huge, yes. That's don't have to turn off the system to do that. What's your vision for the Queen's release? There's some things that we've been working on for quite a while uh, and uh, that we hope to get done in the Queen's release. Matt is, in fact, has been leading this effort for quite some time, uh, so he should, he should yeah, talk about that. It's been a, a bit of an adventure. So um, I've been, uh, we've been working on a feature called container sharding. Um, in essence, uh, the way Swift deploys, I guess, uh, your, your object metadata we're talking about metadata here, um, is we tend to put it into a, a database that gets replicated throughout the, uh, replicated throughout the cluster. So we, in essence, we treat our, container meta, our object and container metadata as objects, which is really awesome. Um, there is a downside to it. When, these, when you create a container, it kind of goes into one of these SQLite databases. Um, uh, and when you, if you start putting heaps and heaps and heaps, we're talking about a really large number of objects, billions. into a billions, into a single container, um, these, these SQLite databases get very large, and um, we've actually done a pretty good job that users don't really notice, but the back end operators notice, because <laughs> notice, when you're moving around these really large files to sync things, to make sure things are up to date, yeah. um, when you just want to start updating these things and do locks on these large files, uh, it just, it's, it's not nice, it gets slower and slower. And it's even this more simple uh, thing is what happens if you have a few billion objects in one uh, Swift container and the storage for that in the system actually actually requires more hard drive space than you actually have. So yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it has to be put on a hard drive someplace and if you have a terabyte hard drive. And you go bigger than a terabyte and this happens, right? And so you also, it also gives you very uneven wear again, right? Like 
uh, load across your cluster because you've got these really large objects that suddenly just fill up uh, half a disk or whatever. So anyway, the idea of container sharding is to, is to uh, behind the scenes, we start separating those large, splitting those large containers into kind of back-end smaller, smaller like databases, sharding, obviously, splitting the data. Uh, the user doesn't see it, they still just see their one container. It just means on the back-end, we can uh, I split the problem up into smaller yeah. pieces. It removes uh, a huge amount of operational uh, operator overhead. overhead. Less locking because there's more different places to lock, so they don't want to lock them too long. Uh, Backend replication across a traffic, a lot smaller. We're moving small objects, things, smaller objects syncing together. Uh, so even just the replication cycles, if you like. So one of the other benefits, especially for the users, for the container sharding work that Matt's been leading is that this brings uh, the, the, not the API, but the functional behavior of a Swift storage cluster to be much more similar to the way users expect uh, something like S3 to behave. So it means that uh, users have a much lower barrier to entry when they're coming from S3 or using existing S3 clients, or even just think about the applications out there that are already written to speak yeah. to AWS. If you then change that endpoint to say, talk to Swift instead, the application doesn't have to be rewritten to take advantage of different characteristics of this. It just works. And this is really the, the whole dream of object storage and especially within OpenStack is you've got an open source storage system that takes care of the hard parts of storage, both from the operator and the end user. And so uh, your job as a developer, as a user of the cloud, is to make an awesome application and just do incredibly good things. You should not have to think about the hardware. And that is the problem that Swift has set out to solve, is that you get, you've got to store stuff, we will store that for you, we will uh, take those bytes from you, we will give those bytes back to you, and we will do that in a way that you will never ever have to think about the hard problems of storage with uh, concurrency and throughputs and uh, locking and uh, scalability. All you have to think about is here's some data and uh, I want it back later. And so... And if you're an operator, I need more space, that's add some more servers, right? Plug yeah. in more servers. If you need Simple more, you can add more where it is. And so I've said this before in almost every time I try to talk about Swift, they know what I'm about to say, which is my vision for Swift is that everyone will be using Swift every day whether they realize it or not because it will be the back-end storage for the internet. It's the world that we live in. And in a lot of ways, we're seeing that happen. Swift is being used to make movies, Swift is used to play games, Swift is being used in scientific research, Swift is being used for data storage everywhere. And it's features like this with container sharding, it's features that allow the operators the ability to do global uh, erasure codes uh, and have very efficient and highly durable storage that helps us meet those goals and fulfill that vision. So I'm really excited about where we're going. I'm really excited about where we are. The community that we get to work with across the entire world is just absolutely phenomenal and I couldn't be more happy to work on this project with these people. If I want to read more about Swift, where do I go? And best where do place I to plug in to contribute? The best place to go for all of that would be swift.openstack.org, which will redirect you to our docs. Um, you can find everything on there. Of course, we always hang out in the OpenStack Swift channel on Freenode IRC. Uh, and of course, the OpenStack mailing list. That's so all the traditional OpenStack ways to get in touch with us. Uh, we're available. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And, uh, look forward to doing this again in six months.